If you're a climate nerd like Richie and I, especially Richie, then you may have heard the term carbon border adjustments. Have you heard it, Richie? I have heard it. I've heard it in a few different ways as well. There's carbon tariffs or carbon taxes, border taxes carbon border adjustment mechanisms. CBAMs. Yeah, that's a short abbreviation for it. So today we are gonna talk about what the CBAM is and demystify that for you, as well as the impact that it's gonna have in Australia. Hi everyone, I am Hannah Melville Ray. I'm an Anne Cantor Fellow at the Australia Institute. And I'm Richie Merzian, the Climate and Energy Program Director at the Australian Institute. Today, we are going to talk about what carbon border adjustments are. For short, you can call them CBAMs. CBAMs. CBAM. <laughs> <laughs> right, so a carbon price is basically putting a cost on carbon pollution. So if you are making a lot of coal fired power or gas fired power or a lot of oil that you're using in your vehicles, you have to find a way to cover the cost of that pollution that's coming out of your tailpipe or out of your factories or out of your power stations, right? And that gets applied either across particular sectors or right across the entire economy. But the whole point of that is that you're making polluters pay for carbon pollution uh, and then with the money that the government can raise or whoever raises that money, that it can invest it back into cleaner ways of doing things. It's how we address climate change. Yeah, it sounds like a really effective way to reduce your emissions. Well, it is effective. In fact, Australia had a carbon price. It had a carbon price from 2012 to 2014, and it worked. It brought down our national emissions by 2%, our economy grew by 5%. So we know it works, but we've kind of scrubbed that away from history. We've moved down the path of not using it. But fortunately, it's back on the agenda because other countries and other jurisdictions are using it. And that's why we're paying attention now. So that's carbon pricing. But what is a CBAM? Essentially, what a CBAM is, is that it allows countries and jurisdictions with carbon pricing to tax foreign imports when they come from places without carbon prices. So let's break this down a little bit. Richie, let's say you're a German steel manufacturer. Yeah. I might be an Australian steel manufacturer. How do you have to account for your carbon? Sure. Well, assuming we're both using the same process, we take coking coal and we um, burn it to create steel. We have a lot of emissions as a result. And in Germany, as is the case in the entire EU, there's a carbon price. So I will be required to pay for my carbon pollution. Uh, and with that payment, the carbon pollution, it goes into a big pot of money that the EU then manages and decides where it's going to invest. Right. But for me in Australia, I don't pay a carbon price. So my steel is actually going to be cheaper and I'm going to export it into Europe. Not good. <laughs> the Europeans will love my cheap steel and have no idea that my processes are more carbon intensive. And that's why the EU jurisdiction is bringing forward a CBAM. Right? Exactly. And, and the whole purpose of that will be to make sure that there is an equal playing field, that Australian steel and German steel face the same carbon price. And they do that by applying the equivalent of a carbon price at the border, a carbon border adjustment mechanism. Right, so those taxes, they're really to level that playing field. Also in the long term, this is supposed to reduce something called carbon leakage. So let's now say I am a massive multinational steel corporation mm -hmm. and I'm going to open up a new plant. Yes. If I have to pay for my carbon in Germany, but not in Australia, I may decide to open up shop in Australia. And actually that then totally undermines the carbon price that you have in Europe, right? Because you did that to try to reduce emissions, but now steel manufacturers are going to places where it's unaccounted for and there's no benefit really. That's right. That's right. So it's to stop cheeky corporates deciding to shop around and find the place where they can go ahead and release their carbon pollution and do so without a carbon price. So it really does even the playing field. And if this is a global problem, then we need a global solution. And that's why adjusting it at the border seems to make sense. But, Richie, I've heard ministers in Australia calling this protectionist. It's true. They do say this is a protectionist move. And what they're saying there is that basically this is actually making things uneven. 
that they're punishing goods that are coming into their country in order to protect their domestic goods, but that couldn't be further from the truth. It's actually the other way around. See, the whole point is you can't get to net zero emissions. You can't reduce your emissions by continue, by still carving out certain parts of your economy and saying, don't worry, you'll never face a carbon price. You'll never have to reduce your carbon pollution. You can't do that, right? You have to get to zero across your economy. So you need to include those industries. And then to make it fair, you need to also include the things they're going to compete with. Mm -hmm. So it's actually the opposite of protectionist. It's about equalizing. It's about fairness. And as a result, those arguments won't really stand up. In fact, the former head of the World Trade Organization has said as much. He said that really trade rules aren't a barrier to doing this because this isn't protectionist. In fact, trade rules are a compass for how to do these things. I think I would take the WTO's word for it, really, over oh, Australia. Of, over Minister Angus Taylor. <laughs> Afraid so. All right, Richie, so Australia doesn't have a carbon price. What does it have? Uh, the 2013 federal election, Tony Abbott came to power and he scrapped the carbon price. Like, it was working and the sky didn't fall in, but he felt like he wanted to and he had the support of his government to scrap it. And what we were left with is just a bucket of money, not very large bucket of money, that pays polluters to just reduce a little bit of their pollution. That's basically it. And it doesn't really work very well, which is why for the four or five years afterwards, emissions increased. Mm -hmm. And since then, they've only started decreasing, but mainly because of a pandemic and because of drought and because of some creative accounting around land use. And for that, you can watch one of our previous videos. <laughs> So what I'm hearing is that Australia is dead against any kind of tax on carbon and they don't want that as their climate policy. But Rishi, what's going to happen when these climate taxes come to Australia? Maybe not from our government, but from overseas. Yeah, that's right. So we can, you know, we can talk about technology, not taxes for as much as we want, but the taxes are coming and they're coming from outside, not from the inside. Right. And, and this is why if we look at where other countries are placed versus Australia, that's why you see the real difference. So countries around the world are increasing their ambition for the next 10 years. And to do that, to meet those targets, carbon prices are being implemented. So on this map, we can see that all of the G7 nations, we have Canada, a lot of states in the US and probably expanding, Italy, Germany, the whole of the EU actually, Japan, Korea, all these countries have carbon prices. Or are bringing in carbon prices in Japan's case, right? And the most interesting thing is that it's not just a developed country thing, right? It's a lot of the trade partners that Australia mainly deals with in East Asia that are also looking at putting carbon prices or have carbon prices. And whilst China might not have one, there's a number of, of um, provinces within China that actually have a pilot ETS scheme. Where, and whilst it might be only a few, that's still 10 times larger than Australia in terms of all the provinces involved. So given the fact that the majority of Australia's fossil fuels and a good chunk of Australia's exposed exports go to Asia, then it's not just what's happening in the EU or the US that's of concern, but what might happen more broadly. Definitely, especially because we're exporting to so many of these countries. And because they're all increasing their carbon targets, right? Japan just increased theirs dramatically. Korea is looking at doing the same. Uh, and China has flagged that it will start to, um, phasing down its coal by 2025. A lot of countries have carbon prices. Yes. But does anyone have a CBAM? No, no one is CBAMing yet. <laughs> so on the 14th of July, the world's largest trading bloc, the European Union, will introduce via its EU Commission to the EU Parliament and the Council the first proposal for a proper carbon border adjustment mechanism, a CBAM. And what's going to start in Europe is probably going to become the model for what other countries, we you know the UK is looking at it, Canada, the US, Japan, also they're, they're, they're watching what's happening as well, to become the model for others to look at. And so that's why it's a good place to start to see what might happen and how it might impact Australia. Totally, a lot of trade expertise in the EU. And also, if I were to put my money on it, I think that there's gonna be a lot of support for this within the EU. Already in March, the European Parliament overwhelmingly voted in support of moving this proposal forward. So I'm excited to see what happens on July 14th. Yeah, it is exciting. And on top of that, Australia is in the process of negotiating a free trade agreement with Europe. So if ever Australia is concerned with how Europe is dealing with trade, then now is the time. So Hannah, 
how will this impact Australia? This is the big question for us. So for Australia, the industries that are going to feel this CBAM are the industries that are both emissions intensive, so they're quite polluting, and they're also very export dependent. A great example of that is our alumina and aluminium industries. Not only are they super emitting because they mostly run on coal, but also we export 80% of our alumina and more than 90% of our aluminium metal overseas. And this makes up the majority of our trade exposed emissions intensive goods, right? Of the 20 billion or so Australian goods that are traded that would fall foul of this, I think, I think around 12 billion would fall into alumina and aluminium as well. So they make up the majority of our exposed goods. They're mainly made for export and they're highly emissions intensive. What's worse, right, is that they're more emissions intensive than alternative sources from other countries. Exactly. So, for example, our aluminium smelters. In Australia, 90% of the smelters run on coal. But overseas, other than China, uh, almost half of that runs on renewables, only a quarter runs on coal. So when you're taxing carbon content, depending on the imports, Australia is going to get really hit. And on top of that, right, most aluminium smelters are owned by two, one of two companies, right, Rio right. Tinto and um, Alcoa. And they own ones that run on hydropower in Canada or Norway, ones that run on geothermal in Iceland or run on gas or, you know, cleaner mm -hmm. um, or less emissions intensive fossil fuels in, in the Gulf and in the Middle East, right? So if I'm Rio Tinto and I'm looking at all my aluminium smelters, then the ones that are running on brown and black coal in Australia are the most emissions intensive. And if I have to hit net zero as a corporation, then that, those are the ones that I'm going to think about changing. Exactly right. Also, sometimes you'll hear analysis saying that the impact to Australia will be very small, mm. but that's really focusing on if only the EU has a CBAM. But we already know that this is like going to be a domino effect. In fact, 64% of our aluminium is already exporting to places with a carbon price or that are thinking of implementing a carbon price. Mm. So whilst some might say, well, we only trade, what, about 1% of our goods with the EU. It's actually looking at the bigger picture. If all G7 countries, if other trade partners like South Korea start looking at this seriously, because they all have net zero by 2050, they're all mm -hmm. looking at increasing their short-term ambition. So it's in their interest to actually even the playing fields and make sure their corporations don't face an impost that others don't have to do face. Mm. Exactly right. Australia is like a quarry we like to dig up our resources and just export that abroad but what that means is that our overseas trade partners they have a lot of influence over our our climate policies and our carbon policies so australia is dependent on uh, the revenue from its exports to balance its accounts and because our electricity is still so coal and gas heavy because our industry, because of our transport, is still so heavily reliant on fossil fuels and still has such a big carbon footprint, it means that all the goods that we trade will carry forward that carbon pollution and therefore face a tax, potentially be more expensive in the economies of our trade partners, right? So we can not do anything on our climate policies here domestically, but the impact of climate policies overseas are going to actually hit and potentially hit hard. Right. Our carbon policies are now being made in Brussels and in Tokyo. And that's quite right. Like ahead of the Climate Ambition Summit in December last year, Prime Minister Scott Morrison said our climate policies won't be decided in Brussels or in London or in the UK or anywhere else in the world. But they are. They are because Australia is so carbon pollution intensive that it's having consequences now for our traded goods. And what's worse, right, is that the revenue made from these sea bams, well, where is that going? It's flying away. We don't get to see it. It disappears overseas. So not only are those policies being made overseas, we're actually paying Brussels to have climate friendly policies. So if you could think about it as probably the worst Australian designed carbon tax, <laughs> where we pay carbon taxes on goods and that revenue goes to other economies to invest in their clean industries. That's basically what could potentially happen. 
So we do have a carbon price after all, potentially. Potentially. <laughs> so Richie, while our government might not want to tax carbon right now, what can we do to lessen the impact of CBAMs for Australian industries? Yeah. The first thing the Australian government should do is just drop the rhetoric around protectionism, right? These aren't protectionists. They, they can't call them tariffs because tariffs are usually used to protect local goods from foreign goods, right? That's why it's a carbon tax or it's a CBAM, mm. right? So instead, engage constructively, shape it so that it could potentially work better for our exports rather than just being on the receiving end of something that works poorly, right? And, and, and part of that is even discussing what's going to happen to the revenue that they raise. There's some developing countries like maybe our partners in the Pacific who could use that money more so than the EU to invest in their economies as well. So there's equity issues that you can negotiate too. Um, but then at the end of the day, let's hedge our bets. If these carbon taxes are coming, then shouldn't we be changing the way we do things here? Right, and actually the CBAM will have a certification process. So if we can demonstrate that our exports are cleaner than when, where we're exporting to, we won't have to pay that tax. So we can avoid it if we power our industries with renewables and demonstrate that we have really clean and green exports. So the first thing would be to say, take those aluminium smelters on the mainland of Australia that are running on brown and black coal for their electricity and see how we could switch them on to clean green electricity. And that would massively improve their carbon footprint and hedge them against any carbon price they might be facing from our trade partners. Right. I think CBAMs could be a great thing for Australia. Bam. <laughs> Thanks for watching. If you learned anything today, please give us a like, leave us a comment, or share this with your friends. We make these videos to help explain to you things that we think are important for changing the public policy space in Australia. So it's as useful as you think it should be. So get it out there, have conversations based on what we're giving you. If you have feedback, send it in as well. And if you want us to do more of these, then even think about donating. We're a research think tank. We work uh, from a place of independence. We don't take funding from corporates or from political parties or from government, um, unless it's for specifically commissioned work. We do that so that we can do this work, so that we can help you, so that we can make for a more progressive Australia. See you next time on Australia Institute TV.